Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Framing the Future. Uh, my name is Andrew Hochhauser and I have the privilege of being the chair of this great charity. So thank you very much for joining us this evening at the Royal College of Physicians. Um, at the outset, I would like to pay tribute to our development and engagement committees and our extremely dedicated and hardworking staff who have both conceived and made tonight's events organisationally possible. Um, now, I've been instructed to give you a health and safety announcement, so let's get that out of the way. This is the fire exit, and I am told... Yeah, sorry, so you're going to have to really put it over here. And we are not expecting any drills. Uh, on a more optimistic note, after this is over, drinks are being served outside and we have access to the garden. Now, as we start this evening's debate, um, I would like to take a moment to stop and mark our organisation's 60th anniversary. In 1959, our founder, Sheridan Russell, worked as a care worker at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in London. Now, he was a musician, and he was a big fan of the visual arts. Sheridan began to display artworks in the waiting room and in the wards in which he worked. He noticed patients' reaction to the new artworks and began to see just how important art could be to our health and our well-being. With the help from the Nuffield Foundation, Sheridan set out to create a special art collection, and this was to become Paintings in Hospitals, the first and only national collection of art to support people's physical and their mental health. Now today, Paintings in Hospitals works across England, Wales and Northern Ireland. We care for nearly 4,000 artworks in our collection, many of them by world-famous artists. We are a partner to many museums, the National Gallery, the v &A, the Wallace Collections, and we are the Arts Council Collections Health Partner. I would like to say a few words, if I may, about the extraordinary Gentileschi project that we are doing with the National Gallery and how well it has been received. It has received an enormous amount of press coverage, both here and abroad. But for those of you who don't know about it, let me just give you a few words by way of description. It is a project by the National Gallery to show masterpieces outside their usual setting. It was a, a work that they have recently acquired by a 17th century artist, a female artist called Artemisia Gentileschi, she was born in Rome in, in 1593, and she was the daughter of an artist. The painting is a self-portrait that was acquired at the cost of £2.6 million of her as St Catherine of Alexandria. And we have partnered with them as part of their project in displaying that masterpiece, believe it or not, in a GP's surgery in East Yorkshire, in Ponklington. To coin the words of a tweet from the chair of tonight's panel, what a surefire way to increase engagement. And I'm really pleased that our colleagues in the National Gallery are here with us tonight. I would also like to give a plug for our blog, 60 Years and 60 Voices. This presents 60 stories over the year about the difference that art makes to our lives from a whole community of artists, health professionals, museum professionals, people that work in galleries, patrons, trustees, patients, carers, and beyond. You can find these stories on our website and they are well worth reading. So today, we deliver creative activity and arts engagement alongside our loans programme. It is not simply putting artwork in hospitals. We work side by side with patients and care staff to create care spaces that are encouraging, that are enriching, 
that are empowering. We can work with any type of health or social care site nationally, from a GP surgery to a hospice. If your local healthcare site needs art, we would be delighted to help you. Our work is recognised as best practice, and this month we have found out that we have been shortlisted for a Charity Today Special Recognition Award. But tonight, I don't want just to look back and reminisce on our achievements. Soon, we will be writing the next chapter, and we want your help and ideas on what we and our visual arts in sector might do next. So let your ideas be stimulated by the provocation of this fantastic panel of speakers. Help us literally frame the future. Now, I would now like to introduce our chair for this evening's panel. Ed Vasey is the Member of Parliament for Didcot and Wantage. He was Minister for Culture, Communications and the Creative Industries for six years, from 2010 to 2016. He is currently the co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Arts, Health and Wellbeing. Not only is a trustee of the National Youth Theatre, he's chair of something called Creative Fuse. He's a patron of Kids in Museums. So art and health are two subjects very dear to him. I would like you to join me in welcoming our chair, Ed Vasey. Well, um, thank you very much, Andrew. It's a real uh, pleasure and a thrill uh, to be here tonight. And um, as Andrew pointed out, I put out this incredibly erudite tweet about the Gentileschi, saying it was a surefire way to increase engagement. I'm not quite sure why I did such a clunky tweet for such a brilliant and inspiring uh, uh, act that uh, Paintings and Hospital has done. But as a tiny insight into my prosaic and boring mind, I have been obsessed for the last two weeks about how on earth they're going to stop it getting nicked uh, from the GP's surgery, because of course every uh, newspaper article was keen to emphasise that it is now valued at £3.6 million. But I know that paintings in hospitals have thought about that, and it's wonderful that everyone uh, has come here tonight to hear tonight's provocation. It's going to be a very provocative pa panel, because we've already had uh, a flaming row about whether to stand or sit <laughs> during our contributions. And as somebody who's emollient and likes to bring people together, I'm going to stand... For, the uh, for my opening remarks, and then I'm going to sit to make the introductions, and then I'm going to leave the panel to decide uh, what they want to do. Uh, one of the other roles I've taken on since I was brutally fired by Theresa May uh, was to become uh, the co-chair with Alan Howarth of the all-party group on arts and health. And this was a poison chalice because I was lucky enough to produce the first white paper on culture uh, we'd had for 50 years when I was the Arts Minister and we couldn't get any money out of the Department of Health or any commitment from them, despite it being run by, at the time by Jeremy Hunt, who was ostensibly a previous Culture Secretary. Uh, so the only paragraph I could put in the white paper was, we will do whatever the arts and uh, all-party group on arts and health comes up with in their white paper. So uh, I then had to work with Alan Howarth to produce our own white paper and see whether the government would take it up. And I'm very pleased to say that Matt Hancock, the new health secretary, uh, is really taking this agenda forward, uh, talking about social prescribing and actually putting some money and thought behind the role uh, that the arts can play uh, in health. And I have to say, I personally, leaving all politics aside, find it extremely inspiring to see a health secretary who's brave enough to talk about this subject, and I say brave advisedly because it's such an easy subject for the tabloids uh, to attack as potentially uh, a waste of money. But we all know, everyone in this room knows, what an enormous difference the arts can make uh, in healthcare. Uh, a few examples that I've uh, jotted down, arts on prescription in Stockport for new mothers offering visual art and music, uh, projects for mothers uh, to help reduce postnatal depression, the Alchemy Project in South London using dance as an effective 
early intervention in psychosis cases, uh, a prescription, arts on prescription program in Cambridgeshire for people of working age, age leading to a significant decrease in depression, the Strokestra, a collaboration between the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and Humber NHS Trust to reduce disability symptoms with people with stroke, uh, those living with dementia, music therapy, a choir in every care home, of course, our Dementia Choir, which was recently on uh, the BBC. So we know that these interventions work. And in fact, this venue couldn't have been uh, better chosen with the Royal College of Physicians in this magnificent Dennis Lasden uh, building. And actually, if you are able to tear yourself away from the garden and the drinks uh, and the networking, uh, there is an exhibition upstairs uh, called Breathe, uh, which is full of visual art representations of breathing, but also the first thing you see is the creation, uh, is the acknowledgement of the creation uh, of a choir by the Royal Brompton and Harefield Arts Foundation to help people who have breathing difficulties, recognising that singing uh, is therapeutic for them as well. So we all know uh, the legions of examples. But now I'm going to sit down to introduce our panel, bringing us together in a spirit of compromise. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a great panel. I'm going to start at the end introducing people. Edmund Duval, uh, you will know, is the internationally acclaimed artist and writer, renowned for his installations of porcelain vessels exhibited across the world, known for his best-selling memoir, The Hair with Amber Eyes, a trustee of the V&A and a patron of paintings in hospitals and hot off the plain from Venice. Errol Francis, Chief Executive of Culture and a wealth of experience across arts and health through former roles as Joint Programme Lead at the Sainsbury Centre for Mental Health, Senior Associate Coordinator at the Department of Health and Inspire Programme Director at Arts Council England, recently the Artistic Director of Anxiety Arts Festival London and also Director of the Curatorial Group PSY. Val Hewitt, Chief Executive of the British Association of Art Therapists, co-founded the Art Therapy Practice Research Network in 2000. You've lectured internationally, Chair of the Claremont Project between 2004 and 2014, an award-winning resource providing art therapies, arts for health and well-being activities to older people. Recently completing a PhD on art therapy groups for work-related stress, which has also worked with the Paintings in Hospitals collection. And finally, Professor Victoria Tischler, Professor of Arts and Health and Head of Dementia Care at the University of West London. A trustee as well of Paintings in Hospitals, a Chartered Psychologist, an Associate Fellow of the British Psychological Society and Senior Fellow at the Institute of Mental Health, leading several projects to develop evidence for arts and multi-sensory approaches in dementia care. Each of our panellists is going to give a short standpoint on how they see the arts playing a role in our wider health and social care system. Then we're going to have a discussion and then we're going to throw it open to the floor. We're going to finish at 7.15 so that everyone has a chance to meet and talk to each other. And Victoria, you've kindly agreed to go first and you're going to be speaking from the lecture. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Fine art in every care setting. This is my manifesto for creative provision in the future for older people. We are an ageing society. The UK has nearly 12 million people aged 65 and over. Of those, 5.4 million are aged over 75, 1.6 million are 85 years or older, and half a million are aged 90 or older. Between the years 2016 and 2046, the population aged 65 or over is forecast to grow more than 50%, and there'll be a more than 100% increase in those aged 75 or over. Ageism remains a societal problem, with many older people finding it hard to access good quality care and services as a result. 850,000 
people live with dementia in the UK. Most of those are older people. The numbers are predicted to reach a million by 2025 and two million by 2051. 70% of people living in care homes have dementia or severe memory problems. And despite increased efforts to find a cure for dementia, there isn't one on the horizon. In the absence of a cure, therefore, how do we ensure that those people living with dementia receive the best quality care possible? The arts have a significant role to play in the lives of older people, many of whom have dementia. Although many care settings are working hard to improve their cultural provision, high quality creative activities are lacking for many. It's a scandal that many older people who after dedicating their adult lives to contributing economically, raising the next generation and supporting their communities are left understimulated and given little choice of what type of activity they wish to participate in. Research evidence supporting the positive benefits of arts for people with dementia is growing. Some of the benefits include increased attentiveness, promotion of meaningful conversation, improvements in mood, and enhanced verbal fluency. So what will the future look like when all older people have access to high quality art that improves the environment, provides stimulation and intellectual challenge, improves their mood and reduces stress, anxiety and depression? I've got three ideas that I want to put forward. Firstly, every care home will have an artist in residence, not simply to offer creative activities, but to work alongside nurses, doctors and carers to challenge and change the culture of care, to bring flexibility, curiosity and inspiration to settings that can often be inflexible, dull and lacking in imagination. Many artists welcome the opportunity to work with older people and find the experience benefits them professionally by providing inspiration to develop their own practice. And some artists are really pushing boundaries to provide novel creative engagement. Two of those, Kate Sweeney and Claire Ford, moved into a care home in Gateshead in 2017, living alongside residents for a month, creating artwork together. Another artist, Chris Green, has developed an experiential theatre piece called The Home, where the audience is invited to move in for two nights to be cared for. Secondly, all GP surgeries up and down the country will have not ragged issues of country life and prima from 20, 2008, but exceptional artwork to enjoy, like paintings in hospitals current project, Artemisia visits, which Andrew has told you about already. And this is important as many older people visit the GP regularly, particularly people who live alone. And thirdly, every hospital across the country will have high quality art on its walls, like the wonderful showcase at the nearby University College Hospital, art that's chosen by patients and staff to provide aesthetic pleasure to stimulate meaningful conversation, to distract from pain and anxiety, and to soothe and reflect upon. Wherever we live, no matter what our health status, we all have a right to access culture. Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, everyone has the right to freely participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts, and to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. So join us to think more like an artist and act creatively and ensure that everyone, including the oldest members of our society, experience the pleasures, enrichment and life-affirming benefits of art. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Val. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you, Victoria. That was a, a really great introduction. And uh, just to pick up your point about the value of art and good art on the walls of where we work and where our service users may be, 
absolutely. Um, I worked in partnership with Paintings in Hospitals for this research on work-related stress, and it was really important to have access to their fantastic um, collection of artworks that was on display on the walls of the organisation within which we worked. Now, one of the most exciting outcome of this research, obviously, was writing and publishing, but really what, re what got me inc incredibly excited was to actually find out that all these professionals from all sorts of backgrounds and status within organisations um, actually connected for the first time with the thought that art may be for them. And the phrase I used to hear the most is, well, I'm no good at art or art isn't really for me. And actually having an invitation to engage and be supported to engage with discussing artworks and making a response uh, using art really opened up the possibility that actually you don't need to be an expert to get engaged in art and it's fine to come at your point and it's fine to go and walk into a museum or a gallery and look at an artwork and see what you think and what you feel about it. And I suppose the first part of my provocation is we need to do a lot of work for visual art to actually really take down this kind of idea that unless you're an expert at art, it's not your business to get engaged in art. And people remembered exactly when they discovered that they were no good at art. They could really pinpoint the time when they kind of stopped getting involved in art making when they were quite young. And unfortunately, it happens at quite a young age. Now, for me, the arts in general, all the arts, are really important because they provide a bridge back to ourselves and to others. They are intensely relational. And we are living at the moment in a society where loneliness has been identified as a really difficult problem, something that's affecting a lot of people. And it's a silent kind of um, status, really, loneliness. People don't say they're lonely necessarily, but they feel it. So we've got a really big part to play in sort of really bringing people together and engage in, this, in, in art activities in whichever sort of level and whatever arts they want to do. And this brings me to um, our children. We have got a tsunami of child mental health issues um, and there are no resources to actually meet this. So I'm kind of looking at the other side of like the beginning of life and it's really great that Victoria thought about um, older people because what's happening with our children at the moment is that the arts are being culled from the curriculum. They are being taken away because there's no resources and they just are not accessed by children who are not lucky enough to get this as part of what their families may provide. So we are forming a problem that's going to be really difficult later because there is, when you do access the arts at school, it opens up something about learning about yourself, about others, about compa compassion, about empathy. It's really part of our mental health and our development. So the more we take the arts away from the curriculum in, in schools, the more we are sort of um, impoverishing the possibilities for our children to use that as part of their own growth and maybe actually take this up as something that they may want to go into. In the work that I do at the British Association of Art Therapists, I can't tell you how many people come to our introductory slots to, you know, when they're about sort of 40, 50. People who've been stuck in the wrong career all their lives and finally they kind of go back and try and do something about it. And very often it's kind of like, well, my parents told me there was no money to be made in the arts, which is really, you know, an issue. But I think there's something about maybe presenting that as a possibility is that if you can't make a career out of it, maybe you would like to kind of have it as part of your life anyway. So my provocation is we really need to kind of start campaigning for the arts not to disappear from our children's lives at school. Very important is provided at school. But also re research does show that how arts are taught is really important. It's not just about throwing a few paintbrushes and sort of doing something because, you know, by somebody who's not particularly well, um, well trained to do that or doing a Shakespeare play badly that's going to put a child off looking at Shakespeare or theatre for the rest of their lives. 
the way that we teach the arts is also incredibly important. So it's not just bringing the arts back into schools, it's actually bringing quality of teaching in arts in schools. And I think this is um, you know, something that I would like to kind of see as a framing of the future to really get back to stopping this belief that cramming our kids with more and more exams and more and more of the more academic subject is going to be creating some well-balanced and actually resilient adults because I fear it's not. So we really need to kind of like value the, the arts within our children's work. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, happy birthday and congratulations to Paintings in Hospital for your 60 years of promoting well-being in hospitals with art and beauty. As a visual artist and artistic director of Culture and, which is devoted to opening up who makes and enjoys the arts, I'm a passionate believer in the power of art, not only to produce well-being, but also to question the world in which we live and possibly to suggest new ways of being. In addressing this brief that I've been given, which is about the future of visual arts um, and health, I'd like to stress diversity as well as putting visual arts in context with other art forms and suggest ways in which we can make the arts more representative of our population and how it can address the new social realities in which we live and our changing understanding of the human body in relation to health, science, its care and treatment. This necessarily involves questioning the status of the visual in relation to art and to place it in the context with other art forms. And this is something that we do at Culture and all the time. Even though I'm trained as a visual artist, I always think about what its limits are and how it can gain power by um, its curation within a, a wider artistic context. Um, my starting point is a quotation from the American photographer Diane Arbus. She said, surprisingly for a photographer, a picture is a secret about a secret. The more it tells you, the less you know. Arbus was referring to the limitation of the visual to communicate meaning, the visual overload, particularly in our Western society, and the proliferation of visual information resulting, that often results in a shutdown in our perceptual faculties in which we cease to process the information being conveyed to our brains simply because it's too much. As, the Tate, as Tate said, in their recent 2015 sensorium program, galleries are overwhelmingly visual, but people are not. The brain understands the world by combining what it receives from all five senses. So drawing on the concept of the cyborg, which is the part human, part machine concept, and which we addressed in our recent program at the Wellcome Collection, the increasing progress of medical technology demands that we rethink the boundaries we perceive between human and non-human, between races, genders or classes, and the art forms that can address this. I think this is important in the delivery of art in hospital or healthcare setting for four main reasons. First, healthcare reflects all of the inequalities in our society in relation to race, gender, sexuality, social class, also, the in, in ways such as the overrepresentation of certain groups in particular condition, such as ethnic minorities and mental health, uh, the relationship between positivity or t and TB, or the whole range of conditions and variations in relation to gender. Second, we now know much more about the potential of different art forms to promote well-being, such as singing, as has been mentioned earlier, for people with respiratory disorders, or the benefits of music for people with le living with dementia. And third, the experience of illness can sometimes compromise our various faculties, including the visual, which need to be re-stimulated or reawakened in order for us to regain our health and well-being. And fourth, and quite importantly, visual art is not what it was. It now encom encompasses a range of practices, including video, performance, installation, sound, and even smell, appealing to a greater number of faculties than the purely visual. This is particularly imp uh, important in considering the range of conditions that we've mentioned, and some of which uh, affect particular senses, particular faculties. And there are many more conditions that can affect um, our ways of experience in the world, and our appreciation particularly of visual art. So, drawing on our recent Cyborgs programme, 
Here is a snapshot of a future paintings in hospital programme in collaboration with other arts and health practitioners for the year 2025. There will be a virtual reality and video digital art installation that will be available for a children's hospital, allowing patients not only to experience artworks, but to enter them and to alter the spaces in which the, 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 that are being uh, created and represented in the artworks. There will be a multi-sensory immersive environment in which patients experience sounds, smells, tastes, and, visual, and physical forms inspired by visual artworks, allowing them to record and review their responses through playful measurement devices. An installation, perhaps, of the Italian artist Maria Novella del Signore called Cut Grass, and that replicates the smell of a freshly uh, mown lawn. A retrospective, perhaps, of the Serbian artist Marina Abramovic her sound pieces, video works, installations and photographs, which also involve solo and collaborative performances with audience participation. There could be a performance of Jocelyn Pook's Hysteria, a song cycle for singer and psychiatrists, which Coltrane recently commissioned, which explores the impact of the cycle of psychological trauma on the body. Or perhaps there could be a performance of Remembering Who I Am, a stroke rehabilitation project using dance and movement in collaboration with the contemporary dance uh, uh, venue called The Place. This programme would be delivered by a diverse range of artists in terms of gender, social class, social background and cultural diversity. It would put into context the role of what has been historically understood as visual art or the visual and make connections between all five human senses of sight, hearing, smell, taste and touch. Thank you. Oh, well, follow that at your peril. <laughs> fabulous, fabulous. Three minutes. You've got three minutes of me. Um, last ten years, too much time in oncology units, too much time in sectioned areas of psychiatric hospitals, too many times, too many weeks, too many months, in waiting rooms, I hate Monet. <laughs> <laughs> Three words, paintings in hospitals. By the end of the decade, I hate hospitals. And I hate paintings in hospitals. I hate that strange attenuation of the experience of seeing a picture that was beautiful, hung without love at the wrong scale, glazed in the wrong place, passive. In fact, the words paintings and hospitals are so difficult for me that I was conscious that the only time I had a similar conversation with someone who struggled with, with the new director of the Imperial War Museum, who said that those were the three words that was going to make his life hell. What do we do? What's wrong with Monet in a corridor? It's not where we should start. That passivity is dangerous that attenuation of spaces, that failure to engage with how you move into and round and through spaces is dangerous. Every time you cross a threshold in a hospital, a hospice, a doctor's waiting room, you are very, very exposed. You are dangerously vulnerable. What can you possibly do? What can you possibly bring to that experience of crossing over, crossing into a different space? John Dewey, the American philosopher, wrote an extraordinary book 80 years ago called Art as Experience, trying to take back the 
work that happens in the encounter with art, the work that happens with the encounter with art, not the passivity, the work that happens. And he says that when you experience art, it's like the flight and perching of a bird. You're in flight. You're experiencing it, and it's resonant, and it's working with you. But at a certain moment, you perch, you, you stop. And at that moment, it's resonant. It does something different to you. You are absorbing it. It's a challenge. It's a good word for us. It challenges you, it brings you back to a different space. But actually, it's active. It's the activity of experiencing art that matters, the resonance and the wonder, the flight and the perching. What can we do? I do two things in my life. I make things and I write about them. My whole life, I've been hugely privileged to have my hands in clay. I know the incredible gift of what it is to spend a life somatically, bodily challenged by a return to a material which is complicated and beautiful, gives me, challenges me, and makes me understand myself as a whole human being. I also write books. These two things that somatic wholeness that can come through the exploration and encounter, the encounter with material, that res restoration of the body through touch is also a restoration of our space in the world. It's taking us back to stand again in the world, in a particular space. And that's what words can do too because voice happens in space. So my provocation, my real, deep, felt provocation, is to return us to space and to voice and to the ambition, the real powerful ambition, to bring healing into these spaces. Well, brilliant. Thank you so much. And uh, I think that uh, there are so many uh, knowledgeable people in the audience. I'm going to keep my dialogue with the panel to the bare minimum. But it just uh, occurred to me that there were sort of two or three themes uh, that emerged. And I think um, the first I wanted to talk about was... Victoria's provocation about every hospital and GP surgery should have a painting. Uh, and Edmund's, if I can characterise it, refinement of that, which is, that's all very well, but uh, what if it's done very badly? And whether we can marry that. It's, it's interesting that uh, one of the first things that happened when I became an MP was the Oxford Mail rang me up and said, um, oh, the John Radcliffe is spending 50 grand on a sculpture, what a waste of money. Can we have a quote, please? And uh, my thought then was, it could be a waste of money if it's done badly. If somebody's just ticked a box and said, got to put the sculpture outside the entrance, that's art in hospitals, as opposed to people curating with uh, love and care, with this feeling of, yes, we're going to have paintings in hospital, uh, but it's got to obviously have a healing effect. So I wonder whether panel had thoughts on that, uh, whether you can marry the two. How do you avoid a box-ticking exercise if you do say that everyone should have art in hospitals or GP surgeries? I didn't say any art. I said yes. high-quality art yes. because art can be bad. Mm. It can be done badly. It can distress. It can yep. be ugly. And I also said working in partnership with patients and staff. So that's really important because it has to be the sense of space and place that Edmund referred to has to be taken into consideration. Who it's for, why it's there. 
Is there stuff that you've seen that does work, Evan? Well, I, we're going to hear I, I, about some particular spaces. Um, yes, um, I have seen some extraordinarily uh, remarkable um, art, but not very often. And that's, that's, the, that's the problem. Um, I'm thinking of Michael Craig Martin's work um, in, um, and I've gone and lost the huge mural in Chelsea Westminster. Thank you. St. Mary's. St. Mary's. St. Mary's. There we go. <laughs> He's done it. Okay, Michael's been out there. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I have, I mean, as in terms of the pro provocative nature of this, um, I, do ha I do have worries sometimes about foyer art about some about um, someone very very grand being commissioned to do something very spectacular because that's what a, a trust or a hospital feels it needs um, you know because that's show, showing you know showing the grandeur of their ambition but in fact that actually to fill a foyer with art is actually is actually spectacularly easy to do what's yeah. much more difficult to do is exactly what you're saying is that nuance <sighs> Of, of trying to work in partnership to make each part of the whole uh, of the whole work with the people who are actually going to have to um, deliver the experience, the experiential thing of those patients and clients and people who are actually coming in and actually being in those spaces. So, so part of the whole the whole problem is. Val, do you want to? Yeah, I sort of have a different take on this because um, when working with, um, uh, with staff teams looking at paintings in hospitals um, it was actually really important that these artworks were original they weren't the monies mm. they were really good art and good art was something that could actually bring something familiar and new it took you to a different place the more you looked at it the more you saw in it and in fact, there were just a couple of images that uh, the feedback was really quite negative about. And it was the images that had been sort of selected in a specific um, um, psychiatric ward for, because they were calming. And everybody thought they were dead boring. Um, and people didn't engage with that. But the, the images that were actually provocative, surprising, where people could actually sort of, with, with you know, the, the proposition was, what do you think? Do you like it? What does it make you think? Can you make a story from it? What do you think happens before, after, during this painting? And that was really important because it actually gives permission to people to actually start engaging with art without having a degree in it. So I will defend paintings in lots of different workplaces as something that actually gives access with a bit of, of help to people who don't go to museums and art galleries because they simply think it's for other people, not for them. Well, that was the other theme I wanted to explore. So on the, uh, on the one hand, uh, art everywhere in surgeries and hospitals, but also it seems to me it is potentially a win-win if it's done well in terms of engagement. And I wrote an article uh, for Apollo a while back, uh, which obviously had a dreadful title called, which I came up with, uh, a whistler in uh, Westfield. But the point I was trying to make was that uh, it does seem to me that uh, we've got to move beyond mm. venerating paintings on a museum wall and to have them in surprising locations, yeah. locations, and for people to stumble upon them and pass by them, either in a shopping centre or in, unfortunately, in a, in a hospital. Yeah, or, I'd, I'd like to say something about the integration with architecture, actually. That, I think that um, the architecture of hospitals has got worse, yeah. actually, because of things like PFI, and I think that... Um, uh, for my research at the Slade, I actually studied the um, Foundling Hospital, which was 1746. And it was interesting how, in the design of the hospital, it, they considered the display of art. Exactly. And it ended up being actually the first public art gallery in England. And so uh, I, I think that in the brief for architects, it, I think that the, the, not only the display of art, but as I was suggesting, the activity of art needs to be considered in relation to the design uh, you know the display and the activity of art in the, the design of uh, healthcare settings. I think that's a quite an important way of avoiding it looking like it's just been stuck in some corridor somewhere. 
Uh, absolutely, at the, at the design phase, and I totally agree with you that um, hospitals are, and indeed GP surgeries are all terribly designed off-the-shelf construction projects. And perhaps if uh, we thought more about arts, art in hospitals and in a, in a healthcare setting, it would affect uh, the design quality uh, as well. I think it's really important to, to separate out the, 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 the placing of art that already exists on walls, which has a very valuable role, um, and the commissioning of art for particular spaces, and the creation of art within these settings, um, and, the, um, and the, the idea of, of the experiential as actually, you know, with both artists as a therapeutic kind of experience that, that, that happens within these spaces, the performative nature of, of art within these spaces, which you, you were vigorously evangelizing for. Um, and it seems to me that, that actually, in a funny kind of way, um, just the, it's so much bigger than the word paintings. And I think the pain, paintings are a problem, actually. Right, so if, if I can put, put this out. In fact, what out we're going to do at the end of this session is we're going to rename the charity. <laughs> but that, is, uh, that will be a, a focus group out in the garden after we've yeah. had a couple of yeah. glasses. Uh, but I'm, there are about a dozen more questions I want to ask. I want to ask about the role of museums. I want to ask about the role of, finally, of philanthropists uh, in this area. And I also wanted to talk about uh, how you can use art in hospitals uh, in terms of diversity. But I'm conscious, actually, that I'm taking up too much time. And I know how many people there are in this audience. So I would love someone, uh, any member of this audience, to come in uh, with a comment uh, or with a question. There are two people that I know I'm going to call on, and they who know who they are. Uh, but it, uh, I'd love uh, volunteers to begin with. What? There are microphones, of course. Everyone uh, realises that they will be thrown a microphone. And uh, I'm going to ask Mando Watson, is here from St Mary's, to tell us about the extraordinary work that's going on in St Mary's. There you go. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, and um, thank you to all of you for um, pr provoking us. Um, I am a paediatrician at St Mary's. I um, have the privilege, as so many of us do, to work in a great state institution that is the NHS. Um, and I'm really grateful to you, Edmund, for reminding us of the, the pain and the challenge that thousands of people uh, experience in hospitals every day and I see humanity played out every day in an extraordinary way in our children because I'm a pediatrician and their parents but also across every ward and every hospital um, and um, we recently expanded our children's intensive care unit and therefore rebuilt it, and were fortunate enough to enter a collaboration with the Albers Foundation, who deeply immersed themselves in what we were doing and informed the space of an intensive care unit with the work of Joseph and Annie Albers. A and I can't tell you how transformative that has been. You see, in the most critical situation, Children, parents, staff, feeling differently, feeling, behaving differently, experiencing things differently, and their humanity sort of informed by this beauty around them. Um, I, I wish I could invite everybody <laughs> to come and see. You, you can't have a crowd trawling through an intensive care unit. <laughs> it's really very special. Um, I suppose the question really, which has been sort of playing around, uh, is how we change the discourse. My colleague Lucy, who's in the room, who works in Imperial Charity, and I, and a great heap of others, have had to work jolly hard to get the sort of, um, the barriers to, 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 to fall away in order to enable this to happen. It's not an easy NHS conversation to say, stop everything, we're going to do something rather special and it's going to take time and it's going to involve a whole lot more people. 
um, you know, the NHS doesn't work like that. It needs to get on with things quickly and cheaply and efficiently. Um, and how, how long has it been in, in place now, then? Well, it, I mean, it's half opened and right. the other half is still being built. So and what, what's been the reaction internally, so, as it were? I mean, unbelievable. So staff who have so much more joy in coming to work, they're so much calmer, they're so much happier, they're talking to each other in different ways, they're staying in their jobs, they're not burnt out anymore. A and, and in terms of the people you had to convince, how, how have they reacted? Huh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think when they see it, they are really thrilled. And they feel rather proud, and they were a part of it. Um, so I guess once you get to the point where you have persuaded them all, um, it's, it, it, yeah, it speaks for itself, which is why I want you all to come and see it. But Brilliant. Well, we, we'll, we'll stagger the uh, visits. <laughs> Tim Reeve is responsible for asking me to chair this, so I'm going to ask him <laughs> to make a contribution. Tim Reeve from the Victoria and Albert Museum. I'm fascinated. Uh, a lot of this always comes down to money, but clearly the role of museums working, as we've heard about the National Gallery, working in healthcare is potentially a fantastic one for both sides. Yeah, and I, I, I've been kicking myself for the last, uh, however long the National Gallery project's <laughs> been going on that we didn't come up with. I'm with the first, and Ben, uh, the director of paintings in hospital, has been kind enough to follow up with an email prompting me and the v &A to be the next cab off the rank. Um, I mean, I'm... I'm kind of struck by... by I the think the Elgin... Uh, it's a British Museum. <laughs> <laughs> I was about no, to but it, it's, it's, it's only two-dimensional flat art we're talking about here, as Edmund rightly pointed out. No sculpture. Um, I mean, it, it, it kind of seems to me that there is, there is kind of limitless opportunity to, to engage a, a, a new audience with, with kind of art, and I agree with your, your analysis that actually um, ha having art in a very cathedral-like and uh, kind of venerated space for, for a lot of people is is not how they want to consume their culture or how they how they are uh, comfortable engaging in culture but i also kind of like edmund's point which needs a lot of thought it seems it seems kind of very simplistic and sometimes bordering on the patronizing to suppose that someone might feel better or that carers or those uh, taking somebody to hospital with a life-threatening illness might might somehow have art on a wall make any difference whatsoever to the to what they're coping with. So I kind of know from my kind of career and lots of people here in the room will know that good art in the right environment r lifts your spirits or makes you feel a bit taller or makes you feel a bit more cultivated or a bit more hopeful. But f f for me there's there's a, a lot to kind of consider in how you how you how you how you put that in a different environment and the reaction you're trying to get or the impact you're trying to get from people who are dealing with some of the most difficult moments of their of their kind of life so i kind of get it on a very kind of visceral kind of level in a, in a kind of museum context and i'm really interested in in the opportunities for museums and galleries to to, to take this opportunity to use art to engage and have impact in a completely different setting a completely different context and i know that most museums you know would are, are really up for and are in the right kind of intellectual space to be thinking about how they use their collections more creatively uh, yeah. to, to make people's lives not better different more layered more richer and i i mean i should say i mean i don't uh, obviously see the the museum disappearing i just think uh, art in a different space is, is a different front door through which to get so into the as, you, as you know better than anyone, because yeah. it was one of your big things when you were minister, you know, museums have plenty of stuff sitting behind <laughs> the scenes in storage facilities or you know, wherever it might be. So it's not, it's not the, it's not the, there's, there's plenty to go around. Right. Yes, sir. We have someone down the front. Thank you, Tim. If you want to say who you are and uh, as well. Thanks. Um, my name's Damien Hebron. I work at Nesta, but before that I ran London Arts and Health Forums and worked in a hospital for a long time running an arts programme. I wanted to pick up on Errol's point about um, inequality and about the communities who are not served by the current offer. And the key thing I heard from the comment about St Mary's was the word charity. 
And we, we are in danger, I think, of developing a kind of two-tier NHS system when it comes to the role of the arts in healthcare because so much of it is supported by charities. So even in London, the hospitals that are actively able to engage with paintings and hospitals and other kind of arts endeavours tend to be the ones with big charitable foundations. And parts of the country where that doesn't exist mean that there's whole chunks of the country where this sort of activity just doesn't reach. And often, those parts of the country equate to parts, of, to, you know, parts that experience health inequalities and other broader inequalities. So my question to the panel is, how do we avoid this becoming even more of a kind of privilege uh, and the sort of preserve of rich pockets of the country that can afford the, the fantastic potential that the arts can offer? You, stu you stunned our panel into silence. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, Errol, <laughs> I mean, yes, I agree. I mean, I agree. you've yeah. covered actually. You've covered two two points which I wanted to cover actually. Which one is about health inequalities and and the role that the arts play. And I'm not sure whether my mind has uh, got round at which angle to approach that question. Whether the art itself is a, a different kind of engagement, uh, and also. Um, this point about charity, which is such a loaded uh, word in almost any context, but in this context as well, it's a, it's a, it adds to the feeling of uh, the art being an afterthought, not integrated into healthcare, but also, weirdly, I think you're right, a sort of sense of privilege uh, and elitism in terms of where art is present. Well, you ask a question about how, how what can you do about it? I mean. We're here because we all believe in it stuff, and it's, so it's, it's campaigning. It's, it's, you know, it's making a powerful, powerful case to government and those who have the ear of government. And you chair the all-parliamentary all something, 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 yes. something. <laughs> and the all-parliamentary something, something, something is going to do something about it. Yeah. So you know, we, I mean, it, that's the only way is 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 to you know is is to absolutely nail that voice, you know, that singular voice, which says, actually, this makes a difference for everyone and has to be completely national. But that, as you say, health inequality is, is, is toxic in this country. And that's, you're doing this by doing the research for dance, for God's sake. So actually having, having been able to actually prove, um, you know, prove what happens in this world is hugely important because otherwise people just go, you know, it's just another thing that we can't afford. Yeah, and it's more than just feeling better. I mean, yeah. we're finding some really interesting findings around actually changing people's cognition and behaviour. Mm. Um, but I'm also very aware, because I work alongside artists, that artists, we don't want to commodify what artists are doing. We don't want to dilute that magical, inspirational, creative essence of art by reducing it to numbers and measurements either, but it's a very fine line because politicians and commissioners and policy makers, they want the numbers, they want the hard evidence, they want the facts, and it's sort of, it's quite a, it's quite a difficult line to, to draw, really. Well, it's a good year to do this. I mean, it's your 60th, 60th anniversary, so if, if, you know, if you can't make the message incredibly clear in this year when you're celebrating the 60th anniversary you know this is this is the moment isn't it and as a result of the all-party parliamentary group yeah. for arts health and well-being well, reports in 2017 there's a real there's now a real sea change in momentum yeah. of people lots of whom are in the room who want to really drive this um, mm. area forward and just a word on some of the very powerful institutions the art galleries museums you know people need to actually look at what they're doing and they maybe need to change the way they're operating and they need to reach out to communities who are marginalized who aren't um getting you know the benefits that we get um errol and i were talking recently about you know we're lucky to be in london we have an abundance of arts and culture in london but there are i you know i lived in the midlands for many years you know people there feel they're not getting the same kind of cultural offer and we need to change things i think it needs uh, leadership and as I said earlier, I think weirdly it needs brave leadership. I think Matt Hancock is showing that leadership at very early days and it may come to nothing because he may be gone in three months, who knows, but the way things are going. But um, 
I think it needs local leadership as well, and, and, it leads, and I also think it needs leadership at, at both ends. You know, there, there are a lot of arts practitioners, I tend to use quite bureaucratic language, who think, you know, we're here for the arts, why should I be engaging in healthcare? And obviously there are a lot of local health leaders who think I'm going to get pilloried if I go down this road. But once you cross that Rubicon, actually, uh, you find you, you, you quite easily uh, take people uh, with you. And uh, I totally agree with you that you need, you need the evidence uh, to back it up. But I also think you need a, a gut instinct to follow your, uh, your, your instincts. But uh, we're coming to the wrapping up point. So if, uh, I'd love to take one or two more comments or questions. This one. Oh, 10 minutes. The voice of God has <laughs> emerges occasionally during this discussion to guide us. And uh, we've got one question up there and we've got one down here next. Um, hello, I'm Mia. I don't work for Pengsland Hospitals anymore, very sadly. Um, I was just wondering what the panel think the role of interpretation and curation is in this scenario of artwork in hospitals in regards to kind of what you've all touched on, breaking that barrier of kind of the elite notion that if you don't know about art, then you don't know about art, and recreating the same level of interpretation that is in galleries where people who are engaged in art, who have chosen to go to a gallery and engage in art, in a hospital setting or a care setting is not necessarily going to provide that level of engagement. And I'm just interested in... Um, I think that's a great point. I'm just going to take a couple more and then throw it back onto the panel. Sir. Yes, hello. Um, my name is Richard Cork, and um, I wrote a book on the history of art in hospitals, and I'd just like to stress how incredibly rich that history is. Um, and this very, very important meeting here tonight, which has covered so many issues, um, ought, I think, to also uh, stress the fact that if we look back through the history of art, actually, we will discover that there are so many highly important, eloquent, moving, poignant, just devastatingly great paintings and sculptures that were done centuries ago for hospitals. Mm. Um, part of the trouble is that some of them are no longer in hospitals. Uh, for example, the Matthias Grunewald, the great Eisenheim altarpiece, which is one of the all-time masterpieces of Western art, is no longer in a hospital, and people tend to forget that it was made, actually, for a hospital. The same is true of Piero della Francesca's altarpiece, which is now in his hometown, Borgo San Sepulcro, but it was actually painted for a hospital. Um, you mentioned, didn't you, the Foundling Hospital here yeah. in London. It has an incredibly rich history. Um, uh, William Hogarth, the great hero, wasn't he? Yeah. Of the whole scheme there to bring art into um, a really fine building, which, alas, was demolished. Should and music. never have and been. And music. Handel yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, and I all could the artists go on. subscribed <laughs> to the Foundling Museum. Yeah. Yeah. I, I could go on, but... Maybe I'd just like to end by saying that in January this year, I had um, a mercifully minor operation at St. Mary's in Paddington, uh, which, thank goodness, turned out well. Um, but uh, I remember lying there for a while and doctors telling me quite rightly the important thing they keep, keep saying is to exercise, to get out of the bed if you can, and just walk down the corridor. And so I sort of struggled to get out of bed and, and tried manfully, manfully, <laughs> to walk down the corridor. And to my intense relief, there I discovered a whole series of uh, prints by Richard Deacon, who's an artist that I've always enjoyed looking at. Um, and there they were. And somehow, this whole notion of looking at the prints as I walked down the corridor helped me enormously because I realized how much they were giving me in terms of um, uh, seeing them again and again. I wanted to return to them. I wanted to find out more about these prints and about my reaction to Brilliant. them. They were inspired by a Rudyard Kipling poem. 
and uh, I thoroughly recommend them to anybody who's interested in, in that. Excellent. Well, we will go and visit them, but hopefully not to have a minor operation. The lady next to you wants to ask a question, which uh, makes life a lot easier. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Miranda Stern, University of Cambridge Museums. And I guess I wanted to uh, respond a little bit to Damien and also kind of pick up on some of what you said, Ed, and around how we avoid this maybe being London-centric or only rooted in sort of large, well-resourced um, organisations. And I think that's by, by really recognising the rich ecology of this work across the country in terms of it being something that there are actually lots of individual practitioner, arts practitioners and heritage practitioners really interested in, um, and that it can happen between local museums and their local health settings. It's wonderful and great to have the V&A and the National Gallery involved, but that actually the potential is in that richness across the UK. And, and I suppose this is also a cheeky shout out for an organisation that's only a year old, which is the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance, which is Arts Council supported and is, ma is a sort of network of networks trying to help those things happen on a local level and bring together people in um, culture, arts, heritage and health. Um, because it can, you can do powerful work on a small scale with local collections and artwork too. So maybe that's one part of, of tackling the very real issue around the potential in health inequalities this could exacerbate. I totally agree with that. Right. God, how long have we got? Five, Five minutes. Yeah. Who else would like to make a comment? I mean, I was going to say, so, uh, lady up there, and then I'll... That's a very good point. I've just remembered. I, yeah. I wanted to say to the panel, mm. I mean, I thought the point about, Victoria, you mentioned an artist in residence, a curator in residence. Is that a step too far to have um, the John Radcliffe, my local hospital, have a curator in residence? Isn't that a good idea? <laughs> and the John Radcliffe has a curator in residence. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is the power of, this is what's happening, you see? Tell, uh, I'm going to... My point wasn't about necessarily putting a curator as we know it now in a hospital or in a GP surgery. It was about how you transform what we know as curation or what Joe Bloggs knows as curation from, as Val was saying when he was at school and was told that art wasn't their thing, how we transform that notion of curation and interpretation in artwork into something that is compassionate and compelling and, and understandable by people who who we're told don't access art in the way that you know everyone in this room knows that yeah. well you've got we the, the, the panels now chafing at the bit <laughs> <laughs> I, Errol, Val oh, okay, go on. <laughs> I think what came out of the research I did was that the what really hooks people in are the narratives the stories the stories that are to do with the artworks and working with the curators from paintings in hospitals, what was really brilliant was this thing about, it wasn't just about the aesthetics, it wasn't about the kind of, the, the kind of the arty bits, it was about maybe the story of the artist, what was going on in their life before, during, after, what was the context, the social context of the piece. It's about finding a little bit of you inside that artwork that kind of hooks you in, something that you can relate to. Okay. And then we can sort of move on a bit, but that's the narrative that's really important. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the first time you asked the question, you stressed interpretation, and then you, in the second iteration, you talked about curating. And I think both of them posed really interesting questions in practice in the healthcare environment. I think that uh, the idea of a, you know, a singular reading or uh, the, the way of interpreting an artwork for a public is hugely problematic already in a museum or art gallery setting. And I just hope we don't replicate those practices. In, in the, the, I hope that arts in hospital will be a way to rethink the whole idea of interpretation and make it much more audience uh, focused. But the, the, the curator term is really, really interesting because this is a term that's been hijacked by the art world. Um, it, its origins and has nothing at all to do with art. It has much more to do with looking after people, actually. Mm -hmm. And so I think that uh, the, 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 in both disciplines, as it were, I think it, the practice in hospital is, or in healthcare environments is a chance to rethink this rather aloof notion of interpretation or curating 
that curating actually originated in looking after people actually and, involved in, and having their involvement. It, so I, I think there's a chance for a much more collaborative practice and the recognition that there are multiple readings of an artwork and you can't impose that on an audience. Brilliant. We've got a lady at the top, I think. And, uh, do we, and, uh, somebody in the front, two, three people now in the front, two people in the front. It's become, it's a bit like an auction. Somebody <laughs> just <laughs> stroked their hair and I thought they were going to ask a question. Should we, should we start over there? Um, yep. Yeah. Yep. So I just wanted to respond to my question about the interpretation. Um, I worked as a research evaluation associate with um, Painters in Hospitals on the work that they commissioned from um, Tom Ellis in, the, in collaboration with the Wallace Collection. And I saw some really good example of um, practice of working with members of um, local community association that was attached to a GP surgery um, to ask questions and discuss and really spend that time with people to talk about the paintings and for, to give them space and to ask questions and open up discussion around what their story, how their story is related to the painting and what that interpretation could be. And some really the interpretation boards that were then later placed in the GP surgery and with the painting came from the questions that the people that painting hospitals had worked with oh, had devised and they were much more interesting and much more engaging I think than if someone had just written it, it for them so I think there are some really good examples excellent, already excellent from point. the charity. Uh, so I'm Wendy De Silva. I'm going to ask you a question, the all parli party parliamentary group question about why they didn't actually specifically say anything about money um, and who should be funding the, this work. Um, partly because I've sat on an arts committee for a London hospital which for 15 years has always struggled to find money. Partly because I'm an architect and if we had money allocated at the beginning we could design things in. Um, if it comes at the end, great, but it's really not having the same amount of effect or, in, effect or possibility. Um, what, and, I, and I know part of the reason, you've, you've already answered it, the press come and ask you why you are having a artwork, at, uh, why 50,000 pounds of NHS money has been spent on art rather than on services. But uh, I'd, I'd be very interested to know um, the answer to that question. Yes, I'm going to tell you in a minute. <laughs> that, <there you> go. <laughs> Which microphone <laughs> should she have? <laughs> Very much. Um, so I'm a researcher and a clinician. I'm a pharmacist. I'm also a sculptor. And um, so my research is looking at arts and health. It's actually looking at health architecture. And I'm very interested. Um, you know, I also have problems with the, the title "Paintings in Hospitals." Um, I think my my sort of observation is um, people journeys in health isn't just in hospitals. And I'm very particularly interested in the wider health and social context where health and social care operates. So uh, when we look at primary health care, and I'm so pleased that you're looking at GP practices, and in fact, uh, the most accessed health space we have in this country, and possibly the world, are actually pharmacies. And people access those, not just those who are unwell, but also to prevent the public health interventions. So I'm just very curious and interested in the range of, of the structure of our health care system, and that to be connected with are the artistic developments and arts practice. I say it with a plural, it's actually a really diverse way in you know, possibilities. And hospitals have changed in the last 60 years to where we are now and as, as a healthcare system. And I always feel a bit frustrated that we talk about the hospital as this sort of, something that happened a long time ago, you know, things are different now. We use health systems and spaces in different ways. And, and I'm looking at um, co-designing uh, pharmacy spaces with patients and staff involving artists architects, the public. So this, is, this, will, this will result in a design guide because pharmacies look terrible at the moment. If you visited them recently, um, they're supposed to have a consultation room um, where NHS funded services are delivered. Uh, but the spaces and how comfortable it is or sort of really dis you know, actually are very discomforting and um, can be quite traumatic as well in, in those spaces haven't really been explored. And I'm very interested in this experiential experience of practitioners and patients who use these spaces. So 
I would just like to look at arts in, in health and social space in a more broader context than, than what maybe you've done what has been no, achieved I think so a, far. That's an excellent point. Mm. And uh, the lady next to you is also... Lots of people now want to ask questions, but I think we're running out of time. Mm. Andrew, are you going to have the final word? Yes, sir. You are, yeah. okay. Final word, the oh. Okay. Uh, Kayleigh Hartigan, I advise the Paintings and Hospitals Finance Committee and so for unsurprisingly my questions about money. Um, so you can collect any for sort of data and write reports, but what sort of evidence does the Department, the Treasury, the Government need to see in order to liberate financing? Great. So I think we've come to the end <laughs> of our panel discussion, and I'm going to answer your question, but I want to check whether anyone on the panel wants to make a final point before I do, because then, and then I'm going to ask Andrew to sort of close the proceedings. But I uh, completely agree with you. I think, um, I think all of this comes down ultimately to leadership. I think the money uh, is there. I think uh, the government of the last... Uh, nine years has a lot to answer for uh, and I think it has a lot to answer for because I think they fail to show any leadership in this sort of uh, cultural space. Uh, one of the worst things they did at the very beginning was to cut uh, building schools for the future which was designed as a, um, uh, was presented as an austerity cut we have to save money but uh, Michael Gove who's incidentally one of my closest friends in politics so I know he won't mind me saying this uh, needlessly and very stupidly put the boot into architects and uh, gave a kicking to the whole concept of a beautifully designed, carefully thought out building uh, and indeed not uh, one of our country's most successful professions in the process and yet again set back the cause that I've dedicated my political life to which is to put culture at the heart of everything we do whether it's our schools, our prisons, our health, our education, uh, and uh, anything else uh, that I can think of. Um, and I think it's very frustrating. I think there should be uh, money for the arts in all different aspects. And I think, as I say, that I think Matt Hancock has shown what a difference leadership can make in the contrast with which he's approached his job compared to how Jeremy Hunt uh, approached his job. And I think you can face down uh, very easily the bullies uh, and the naysayers by being brave uh, and showing some leadership. But the real leadership in this room is provided by, first of all, our brilliant panel who have dedicated their lives to the arts, and I'd like to say a huge thank you to. And also the fantastic organisation Paintings in Hospitals so eminently chaired by Andrew Hockney. Three points. Number one, um, we promised you provocation, and you got it. Um, what food for thought? Um, could I say thank you, first of all, to the chair, to my panel members, and to the audience for the questions and comments that were made? It has, it's been an hour and 20 minutes, and it's gone like that. Thank you very much. Could we give them a round of applause, please? <laughs> Second point. Um, can I offer a provocation of my own? We have heard from the front row two questions at the very end about money. One of the great scandals about our organisation is that we do not receive one penny of government money. Not at all. Not under this government, not under Labour governments. We have got no governmental support at all. And Ed is right. We need champions because the work that we do is good and meaningful and needs to go on and improve. And you've got to put petrol in the tank in order to do it. And we need champions, both locally, nationally, and within Parliament, to achieve a change in that situation. And it's very important. So that's my provocation. And finally, to make closing remarks, could I welcome my fellow trustee, Dr. Mary Black. She is multi-talented. Not only is she a doctor, she is a singer, she is a writer, and she's going to offer you some closing remarks. Thank you. 
So it's my uh, great pleasure to welcome you to the Royal College of Physicians, of which I'm a fellow. Um, we've just celebrated our 500 years anniversary. Um, sorry, but we have. <laughs> and we've, the college is open for you tonight. Take a moment to walk up the circular route to the top where you'll pass 500 years of portraits of our presidents. You may find a few women in there um, because they let us in recently. Um, enjoy the apothecary jars outside. You'll enjoy this, Edmund. Fantastic ceramics. Uh, the college treasure room is open for your perusal. You will all uh, lots of silver. Do not take it home, please. <laughs> uh, silver, gold, all sorts of precious things. You will meet a living treasure of the college in Dr. Henry Oakley. Is Henry in the room? I think he may be outside. Oh, there he is, Henry. <laughs> a living treasure, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Oakley is a retired uh, doctor who curates the gardens. Do not call him a gardener. He gets very offended if you do. He curates the gardens and is going to give you short uh, little tours explaining the medicinal and sometimes very toxic plants. Do not eat the plants. Um, so you'll enjoy meeting Henry. Um, you will enjoy meeting a fascinating collection of, I mean, uh, the, the list for this room is extraordinary. If you see someone wearing a pink badge, it means they're staff or volunteers or trustees, and they will help you if you'd like to join our mailing list. Um, read about us. We have a book outside. Um, hold the date for the 25th of November gala dinner um, at Draper's Hall. It's apparently also has a silent auction. I always get worried when I hear that because I think it means you can't talk, but this is not true. Um, it's going to be a glittering affair. Um, and also you can join, please join if you'd like to, our patrons or our members list. Uh, on the subject of leadership. Sometimes it feels like a very dark world. I think of public discourse, of politics. I'm not going to mention some of the words beginning with B or anything else like that. It can be a dark world out there. Um, but one of the darkest places and moments I've ever seen is Sarajevo during the war, where I set up the medical evacuation program for people who'd been wounded. And the first time I walked into one of the main hospitals with my flak jacket, my helmet, and I'd just been shot at and I was very upset. And I walked into uh, the main corridor and I met um, actors rehearsing the musical Hair. <laughs> and I thought, this has really turned my ideas on my head. And it, remember, this is a hospital with no heating. So they're rehearsing the musical Hair. Um, and it made me realize leadership is probably the most important thing, even more than money or funds, it's commitment, it's leadership. And Edmund, I'm reminded of you and your feeling when you walk into a hospital. And that uh, musical really transformed the place, um, as did the surgeon there, Abdullah Nakash, who made, in the midst of winter, when there was no heating, he made all the doctors do ward rounds once wearing short-sleeved white coats because he thought it would cheer people up and show them that you know, we have a fighting spirit here and we're humans, we're all in this together. Now the man who organised Hair the Musical in Sarajevo Hospital is here tonight. He flew in from Bosnia with his wife. His name is... Sorry, I get right up. His name is Dr. Bakir Nakash, and that is his wife, Dr. Amina Nakash. So if you ever feel that it's too difficult to do something, just talk to them. <laughs> now, the last thing I would say is Dr. Nakash also organized a celebration once where he thanked, he gave awards to the ambulance service, the fire brigade, the doctors, the nurses, 
and I was at that celebration and I was kind of a bit surprised to see that he also acknowledged the Sarajevo beer factory for maintaining production of beer through the war <laughs> and raising everybody's spirits. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please join us for refreshments for tonight we celebrate. <laughs>